What's up, folks? My name is Lucas, and in this video, we're going to talk about Claude Sonnet 3.5, the new model released by Anthropic, and this amazing new feature they released called Artifacts that I think it was supposed to be a replacement or a substitute for something like custom GPTs. But in the end, it introduces a bunch of amazing new features in terms of interactivity and making prompting and coding dynamic right in the Claude interface. So that's what I want to discuss today. If you don't know what that is, don't worry, we're going to talk about it. So Claude 3.5 Sonnet, we can click quickly go to the release blog post by Anthropic and it's this new model that came out and essentially has this amazing performance uh, with respect to like top models like GPT-4. So you can see here on the GPQA data set, it's doing 59.4%. In undergraduate level knowledge, MMLU data set, it's doing 88.7%. So the model is amazing, right? It's uh, in part and it's better than top performing models right now. And it's a pretty fun model to use when you combine it with uh, Anthropic's artifacts. So if you don't know what artifacts are, uh, so artifacts essentially allow Claude to share standalone content uh, in a separate window for the main conversation. So you can essentially build interactive apps and you see the result of what you're trying to build on your right. It's like the most fun way to build right now uh, is to use artifacts and then, you know, you see what you're building on your right as you're discussing, talking to the model and so on and so forth. So we're going to use these two and we're going to explore some use cases. Okay. So the first example I want to build is an interactive app that creates uh, like a quiz over some content of a PDF. So I have this prompt, create a React app with interactive quizzes about all the most important information contained in the PDF. And then I also want to add in the PDF itself. So I downloaded a PDF just now. I'm going to find it right here. PDF, PDF, PDF. And PDF is right. Guidelines, Tenex. Ah, yeah. Future consumer edge computing with that. Yeah, this is the PDF. So now let's send that to the Claude model and let's see what happens. So what's cool about this is that because you get, there you go, because you get this window here on your right, you can inspect the code. You can switch dynamically between the code that's generated and the preview. And what I really like is that because you get the code and you get to actually test it out live, it makes the process so more enjoyable to build. So here we go. This is the, the quiz that you get. Now, I've done this before and I got a different interface. However, what I like about it is that it's kind of consistent in generating a quiz with like between three to five questions when I don't specify how many questions I want. And it gives me this interface of like multi-choice questions, multiple choice questions, and this next little button which is pretty neat. The previous version that I generated before was a little bit better. So we might open up the, the previous version that I did so that you can get a sense for what can, you can, what can you get out of the box with this, okay? Because this is not the best way to prompt. From a prompt engineer perspective, I would break this problem down into quite a few prompts in order to get the best performance possible for the full app. For example, I would do a little bit of knowledge generation on top of this PDF. Then I would uh, separate in a separate prompt, just generate a bunch of high quality questions, inspect the quality of those questions, and then say, look, create a quiz app for that takes in like a JSON of questions so that I can have the data and the app separated and make it for a more modular and a reusable uh, piece of code. However, this is awesome, right? So what's the main goal of proposed AGI? So I have no idea because I haven't read the paper yet, but let's see, replace smartphones. And then next, which of the following are pillars of proposed para paradigm? Shared compute. And then the proposed AGI hub architecture aims to centralize all power. These are all relevant questions to the PDF itself. Centralized power and remove capabilities. No, that's not true. What's the name of the central component responsible for managed resources? What I like is that in this case, the quiz generated was multiple choice, true and false, and uh, open-ended questions. So this is pretty cool. Actually, this one is not open-ended, but you have to give some text input to uh, get a response back. Managing resources and scheduling tests. What's the name? I'm not sure. 
So let's see, finish. And now you can see that my score wasn't great, but I love that I actually got a score on top of this. And then I can restart. So uh, obviously you can you know, build on top of this and add validation on the source of the PDF. I could include quotes to justify each uh, alternative and I can you know, build a bunch of stuff on top of this. And before we move on to the next use case, I just wanna show you the previous version that I did uh, on another PDF where I said, create a React app with interactive quiz about all the most important information contained in this PDF, right? And if I open up the preview here for the previous app that I was, uh, that I was doing, this is what I got. Look at that. This is actually one of my favorites because if I come here and I say, uh, I get the right question, I get the feedback immediately on the screen with this green little highlighting, but if I get it wrong, it's red. So I really like this. I feel like because I, because I've built, I actually didn't build anything. I just prompted the model. I know very little react. So I just prompted the model to do this for me. And the fact that we can turn information into interactive, anything, a quiz, a dashboard, a visualization, because we can give life and behavior to static information. This makes this artifacts plus clots on it 3.5 such a powerful tool, right? Something that we can also get in custom GPTs or even in the regular ChatGPT interface when you ask it to run code and so on and so forth. But artifacts really brings things to another level. And I can come here. I can, you know, if I put the wrong, there you go. So it's it's pretty cool. Uh, the issue maybe on this system is that because you get the right answer right away you don't get a score at the end so you don't get that sense of improvement but uh that's that's you know something that you can easily iterate on and uh and improve so yeah this is pretty cool and then i can finish and you can see i got a score of five out of five which is actually not true so i see that the the calculation of the score is actually incorrect because the i just got the fourth question wrong and it said five out of five either way, but these are little things that you can tweak. And I would add in, you know, grounding on the source and so on, just like I mentioned before. So this is a really cool example of what you can do off the bat with Claude Sonnet 3.5 plus artifacts. Now, uh, if we go on to the next example that I want to do, I want to do interactive mind maps, which is something that we've, we're all, we've all seen before. Uh, there's actually a great video uh, by YouTuber, I think the channel is called AI Foundations. I'll, I'll put a link in the description and you should definitely check him out. And he had like a bunch of use cases that were really cool. And I liked this video because the use cases were actually interesting and, um, you know, insightful rather than just obvious uh, examples of things that you can do with this kind of stuff. So pretty cool. Check it out. Uh, so the next example is going to be interactive mind maps. So I'm going to show first the one that I already did. So this is the one that I already created. So the prompt initially was, let's create an interactive and draggable mind map visualization of potential use cases of large language models to augment human intelligence, whatever, just a random topic. And what I'm interested in is to see the quality of the mind map that's generated because mind maps, flowcharts, diagrams have shown to be such a useful tool for learning and development and whatever. And this is what I got. And I really like this. Of course, it's not perfect. There's like this weirdness of the edges getting on top of the nodes and stuff. But as you can see, the examples generated make sense. The draggable nodes are useful and readable. And it's not that hard to come here and actually do a few tweaks and make this a little bit better. Like, for example, right now, uh, let's reorganize this. Let's try to see if the first arrangement of these nodes um can be like a like a tree rather than this very weird edges on top of stuff system that we got going on here so let me see if i do this and i do this yeah they all connect to each other which is annoying so let's see make the structure of the diagram more like a tree so that the edges don't overlap on top of notes let's see if that helps with the quality of the generated diagram so now it's generating the react code which is awesome right 
Again, for with respect to the data for the diagram, I would prefer the data to be separated so that we have this modular interface. However, there we go. So now, so now we get actually a more tree-like system. I mean, it's still a bit weird. There are a few things that are still a little bit like, but maybe this is related to the interface itself and to how it's you know generating the actual interface. But I mean, this is pretty awesome, right? So we get what we asked for with, of course, it's not perfect, but it's good enough that, you know, I could have easily took this and, you know, screenshotted this or used this as part of my learning and research, whatever I was learning and researching on. And the fact that you can do this so fast and it has so much customizable capability power and so on and so forth, for me, it makes it fascinating amazing incredible i love it i think it's the coolest thing ever so interactive diagrams and flowcharts that's great uh we can even take this a step further right so if i go back here let's do an example that actually didn't prepare i'm gonna i'm gonna go here and i'm gonna go to my code and i'm gonna i'm gonna uh I'm going to get the output of some piece of script that I have here on my machine, which is like a Python script that uses the ChatGPT API to generate the chapter section of a YouTube video, right? I use this every time I upload a video on YouTube. And what I would like Claude to do is to make a uh, flowchart of the code. So make a, uh, make a flowchart, make a precise flowchart of the flow of the following piece of code. Make sure to be minimalistic while maintain at uh, well displaying all the important information, something like that. And now I send that to the model and let's see what kind of visualization we get. So now we're going to create a flow chart. So it's generating. So now again, the code, in this case, creating a mermaid, uh, mermaid diagram. I mean, yeah, this, I don't like it so much because this is more like a regular diagram rather than a flow chart. But let's see, but I mean, it does get the flow correctly, right? The imports and the initialization of the open AI client. That's correct. Defining the get response function and then getting the video transcription from the clipboard, creating a prompt, creating a second prompt, getting the rest of the description. Yeah, that's, that's correct, I guess. Uh, maybe, let's see, let's see something more interesting. Write a simple piece of Python code that contains, that contains if statements, uh, a while loop, and you know does something to some input let's see because i want to write this piece of code then i'm going to refeed refed i'm going to take the piece of code and then i'm going to send that to the model again and i want the model to create a flow chart out of this piece of code so now okay now i'm going to say create a flow chart of this piece of code And I'm just going to say that. Let's see what happens. And I didn't have to re, I get, like give the code again. I just felt like it, it made sense. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Now, this is, this is something I like a little bit more. Because as you can see, now we have the if statement represented correctly in the flowchart vocabulary. We have the, the pro, so if no, then you go here. If yes, you go there. This is what I like. Because this gives you another way of looking at a piece of code. Maybe you could have explained the code in a way, but when you can see it visually like this and you can see, you can do it immediately. That's, that's the kind of stuff I like, because this is cool. This is useful. This is something that, you know, you can switch between reading some piece of code and looking at something like this, right? Maybe now that we're doing this, I'm thinking what would be cool is that if what if we created a simple React app that has the code on the left and it has this uh, flowchart 
uh, visualization on the right and when you highlight a piece of the code it highlights with the same color the the place where you are located in the flow chart I don't know if this is gonna work I'm doing this right now but let's take a look so let's build a react app where the piece of code the piece of Python code is shown on the left and the flowchart on the right. When the user highlights a part of the code, the flowchart should highlight with the same color the corresponding node or location in the flowchart. Let's see if, if that works, it would be so cool because this is very, this is a complicated app. But if it doesn't, I mean, it's fine. We'll try it a few times just to see if this kind of powerful capability is something that we could, you know, actually build this easily. That'd be really cool, actually. Let's see. Okay, so that, that's expected. We get an error. And what do you do when you get an error is just stop the, the response from Claude. Uh, you just stop it and you just feed the error back. And you can do this a few times, but I'm not going to be eternally refeeding the error or, you know, trying to generate this. If I see that it doesn't work in like three or four attempts, uh, then we got to rethink the problem and the way that we're uh, stating the problem for the model, because it's not going to, it's not going to happen. But it seems very doable from what I'm looking at in the piece of code that's being generated. So let's see what happens when we, there we go. Okay. So, all right. All right. So we get. We, oh, that's cool. <laughs> okay, so it's not the most beautiful thing ever, right? But <laughs> that is really cool. So it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of horrible looking with respect to the visualization we were getting before. But I mean, this is pretty nice because it's actually doing the update and highlight. Ah, oh, this is really cool. Because, I mean, all right, it's not beautiful looking, but it, 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 it works. It does the thing that I asked. The problem is that now the flowchart is not a flowchart anymore. It's just a bunch of rectangles. It doesn't have that nice flowchart capability. So let's see if we can make the visualization on the right a little bit better. Okay, great. But can you make the visualization on the right more like an actual flowchart? that respects the uh, different parts of the code instead of just rectangles. Let's see if that actually improves the visualization on the right. But I'm so impressed that I got this capability out of the box. This is the coolest thing ever. Because, I mean, think about it in terms of what it means in, uh, for... Uh, what you can do with information and when you're trying to read and understand and learn about programming the fact that you can do these things and just out of the box you know get going with stuff this is this is so cool all right so let's see let's see let's hope for the best come on oh it works it works i can't believe it this is so cool so now if is the number even yes oh this is the coolest oh my god this is the coolest stuff ever it actually does work out of the box i've never seen this before this is the coolest thing ever and it's actually correct i mean that's that's amazing initializing variables yeah and then while number is now one so this is the while loop yep oh my god this is the coolest all right so as you can see, artifacts uh, with Claw 3.5 can give you some unbelievable capabilities, right? The fact that you can do something like this, which is something I always wanted to build, but it would take a long time to write. I don't know how many lines of code. I mean, this, there's a bunch. And now this is a script I can just, uh, I can just download and now it's mine, right? So what I would like to do is I'm going to try one last thing before we wrap up. Perfect. Now make it so that the um, user can upload a piece of code or 
uh, .txt file and the flowchart interactive visualization is created uh, automatically and displayed in the current interface. So all I want to do is make this script something that would, would work not just for this particular piece of code that was written, but for any piece of code or a file that's uploaded. And what's cool is that if I don't like the version that's generated, what's really nice about uh, Artifact is that you can go back a version of what you generated, which is amazing in so many different ways, right? Because you can actually inspect what was working before and you can make the connections between what's missing and so on and so forth. So now I get this nice thing, which looks like it's going to work. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select some piece of code from my machine. So I'm going to choose file. I'm going to come here to desktop projects. Uh, let's see, uh, learning, learning and the uh, ask paper. There you go. This is uh, an automation to like, use uh i think it was ChatGPT or something to like and um, do rag like converse with or chat with a paper so let's see okay all right yeah the, the code i wrote is not exactly amazing but okay i don't know if it's working let's see okay all right so imports okay ah okay so i have all the imports here all right that's nice let's see app something okay import typer app typer oh that's it's working yeah it, it does work that's amazing <laughs> that is the coolest that's so cool because now folks i can just come here and i can download to file right i can download the script that does this and now this is mine forever so i can use this on my machine to do whatever i want right i download this as a tsx file and that's it i can run it locally on my machine this is mine and uh I mean, think about it in terms of what this does to development, what this does to, for me, I'm not really interested in what this does to development, like engineering in general. I think that my interest is more what this does to what we think we can do with data, compute, writing apps, using AI to augment our capabilities, because you can now represent information in so much richer ways. And the fact that's faster and faster allows you to like really explore things at a deeper and deeper level. Of course, that it also creates an incentive for you to stay on this kind of shallow, superficial level of just creating fun demo apps for all sorts of stuff and never actually, you know, reading the 350 page PDF or an actual, never actually doing the hard work. So you got to understand that when I talk about this as augmenting capability and learning, you still have to do all the hard slow, meticulous work, but now you have tools to make that work so much more enjoyable, fluid, in par with your capabilities. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I think that as a last example, uh, we can, let me see, I have a few examples prepared. Uh, let's do something with interactive visualization of data, perhaps. So the yeah so the for example you can take let's say a table or some some file with some data and you can easily turn that into this interactive visualization dashboard and so on and so forth so if i take let's say uh let's let's actually do everything within cloud so let's say create a table with some data about uh some data about anything. I don't know. Uh, make it like a simulation that is that is interesting for, I don't know. Let's just say create a table with some data. Let's see what it comes up with. So it's going to create some simulated table. Uh, okay, so it's going to simulate growth of plant species and soil pH levels. Okay, whatever it is. All right. So it's generating that and okay. So it just generates some code and it's printing some code. That's great. Okay, cool. So now that we have this data, uh, what I would like the model to do is organize the data into a, um, into a, like a CSV or table. So organize the data into a CSV. Okay. 
So now it's going to organize the data into a CSV. So it's creating that data. It's, you know, simulating some random data. It's okay. Perfect. Now build an interactive dashboard to visualize dynamically different pieces of this data. So now it's going to, hopefully it's going to take in the data and it's going to give me a dashboard that allows me to interact with the data. What I'm seeing is that the data that's been created, it's being redone here as just simulated data, which I don't like very much. It's not what I was going for, but it's okay because I didn't have the CSV to upload right away. But there we go. Now this is cool because now we get like a nice little dashboard with data from the thing and we can have a selection thing and we can change it. Ah, oh, that's very nice. So we can come here care and it's essentially it's plotting. I think it's growth rate centimeters per week, grow, growth rate of different, I think, vegetables, carrot uh, and tomato by, um, uh, by soil pH which is, you know, fine. So you have soil pH on the X axis and the growth rate on the um, Y axis. I think that's what we're getting here. Right. And that's, you see, I mean, you see what you can do with this kind of stuff, right? Because now you can come here, upload some data from anywhere. Uh, for example, I could come to my Google sheets. That's I'm just going to download some a CSV I have here. Okay. I have my, a little bit of my YouTube stats in a YouTube, in a Google sheet. So I'm going to download this as a CSV. So I got to download this as a CSV. Perfect. And now I'm going to go back here. Okay, cool. Now do uh, create an interactive dashboard for this CSV file. Allowing me to visualize all the data within it. And now I'm going to upload the data that I just, uh, that I just downloaded there. So let's just CSV. Uh, what's the name of the data? The okay, power to Let me see here. Where is it? Where is it? Okay. Self-tracking. There we go. So now I'm going to upload this and I'm going to just upload the table. I just upload the CSV and now I'm asking to visualize the data in some nice little way. I mean, it does, it seems like it does take the data from the CSV and then it puts inside of React, which I don't like very much. I would prefer it to just be an app that I upload, but it's fine. I didn't ask for that. And there we go. Oh, this is the coolest. Look at that. So you get, I get my revenue, subscribers, RPMs. Now, there are a few issues with, with this. For example, I get RPM, but the problem is the y-axis is for, on the left, I think it's for my... Uh, it's revenue. So it's revenue on the left. Okay. In, in the purple, the purple line. And now if I remove revenue, I put subscribers, you get the green line, which is yeah, the subscriber growth rate between April 16th and June 5th, 25th. Uh, and now for RPM, Okay, now I, I would have to see RPM. Yeah, so I see a little, some issues with the visualization, but this is insane. This is amazing. Like the fact that I can switch with a slide and it gives me ideas for how I would like to build this in the future. And the fact that it's just React app, React code running here locally, it is just mind blowing. It's just, this is the coolest thing ever, right? Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that you can do with, uh, clots on 3.5 and artifacts. If you like this video, don't forget to like, and subscribe and see you next time. Cheers.